We're going to give about five minutes for, uh, we have quite a few people coming in, so in five minutes we'll start. Good evening, everyone. Hello? Can you hear me in the back? All right. Well, I wanted to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule today to join us. Uh, and before I start, I have to acknowledge a few people in the audience. We have with us uh, Mayor Fred Cleveland. We also have with us Commissioner Jason McGurk. Jason. And then also we have Vice Mayor Randy Hartman. He's in the back. We have Commissioner Lisa Martin. Lisa. And also I have a few staff members that I wanted to acknowledge as well. Uh, I have with us uh, Assistant City Manager Ryan, uh, Ron Nybert. Ron? 
And also our city engineer, Kyle Fagley, and then senior city civil engineer, Jesse Myers. And I'm Khaled Reshadat, I'm the city manager. And before I start, I just want to let you know that there is no words that can describe what you're feeling now and what you felt a month ago. I know the frustration level that you have, the agony, the stress that you have to go through with, first you had the flooded home, then you have to go through the recovery, the repair, dealing with the insurance company, dealing with FEMA, and dealing with the permitting agency. So we feel your pain. So the commission, right after the two hurricanes, they asked the staff, they said, we need to have a third party to investigate and analyze of what happened in Ian and Nicole. So I started doing the search to find someone who has not done or worked for a developer in New Smyrna Beach. So this, I wanted to be unbiased. So we searched and we found an expert that works for Jones Edmonds. His name is Britt Cunningham and Kyle here shortly, he will introduce him. But I wanna assure you that we will not leave any stones unturned. I wanted to make sure that we have an action plan for this exposure analysis. So basically, at the end, when he provides the report to the city commission, we will have another public meeting where you have a chance to, to see what happened. So we want him to find out why did it happen, how did it happen, and what we could do to prevent it from happening. And with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Mayor Cleveland wants to say a few words and then we'll turn it over to the experts to go over the PowerPoint. But please, let the expert do the PowerPoint. Don't interrupt the, the presentation and then we'll give a chance for public participation after he completes his presentation. Now, with this crowd, we will be limiting the comments to three minutes. So if you have something new to tell us, whether it's an information, whether it's a video, pictures, we have provided for you information sheets. And also we created an email address that you could email the information to that specific address that we will keep it. This meeting is actually being videoed, will be posted on our website. And then if you ask any questions during this session, and we, will, we do not have the answer for it, we will put the answers on our website after the meeting, probably within a week. So please, let's listen to the experts, what he's got to tell us, and then we'll go from there. So Mayor Cleveland, please. Good evening, fellow citizens. Thank you for turning out tonight. Uh, it is a joy to see the uh, enthusiasm, commitment. Uh, I understand it's your lives, it's your, it's your livelihood, and so I get why we're all here. Uh, if you and your home flooded or your yard flooded, can I see your hands? Okay, I hope the press is checking that out. This is a town that was devastated. Over 1,200 people got somewhere from four, four inches to four feet of water in their homes. And many are not in their homes today. Those that are in their homes uh, are in different stages of disrepair. And so I've got hundreds of stories of neighbors helping neighbors, friends helping friends, not just helping them out, staying week after week and uh, bringing food and, and truly being a steward of the whole. So I wanted to, wanted to recognize that, that, that I know you're hurting and I know that's going on. 
And that is what New Smyrna is, right? This is a giving town, and so we're taking care of each other, but we're going to get help from the outside. I had the opportunity to spend some time with the governor today. Uh, and the first installment is coming to the state of $100 million. The check was uh, presented today. Volusia County will get $37.6 million of that immediately. I've been on the phone with Danny Robbins, our county councilman, said, Danny, how's that going to be divided? I want to get in line. I'm ready. We've got the documentation. We're ready to go. So those funds are coming our way. Stay tuned. We're working at light speed comparatively to other disasters that have happened in the past. The, the governor's uh, been no nonsense about this. It's coming. It, uh, help, is, help is really on the way. I've talked with Senator Tom Wright about uh, about helping us cut through the red tape. Uh, agency versus agency. Uh, I've gotten all your letters and your emails that say, hey, we're fighting the DEP. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you help us? Uh, so those uh, pleas for assistance, those demands for help are being heard at the state level, at the federal level. I was with Corey Mills today, and Corey has this front and center as well. So we're going to not play ping pong ball with no, that's the county issue, no, that's a state issue, no, that's, we're going to have the leadership round table and we're gonna solve this together. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to one more time go over the rules of engagement for tonight just to make sure you know and so that you're not frustrated or impatient. First off, there are maps around the room. If you've been flooded and your red dot is not on the map, put it on the map. There are identical maps around the room if you haven't been up there to check your home, go up there and put the dot on the map, please. And we will consolidate, they're, they're identical maps. Uh, we'll consolidate those to make sure. The other thing is that will help us reach out to you if we haven't already got you on our list. And our chief engineer, Kyle Fegley, is an amazing engineer. And uh, so you're gonna hear more from him in a few minutes. And so. The logic and science and math that we will go after this is important. We wanted to hire an expert. Many of us have strongly held opinions. We have tightly held uh, uh, opinions about, oh, this is what caused that. I just know it. Well, I want to make sure that the science matches what our myths are. And we'll pop those myths that say, hey, this is the cause if it's not really the cause. And we'll substantiate. The, those that, that are proven to be true. And that won't happen tonight. That's gonna be our journey. We're starting the journey of discovery. And the, as you heard the city manager say, why did it happen? How did it happen? And how can we prevent it from happening again? I can show you photos of 1924 Faulkner where there was four feet of water. So this is not necessarily a new phenomenon to New Smyrna Beach. When Dr. Turnbull came here and said, I want to uh, grow indigo, I want to grow rice and sugar cane, and he developed a, uh, uh, the very first, the country's first Egyptian irrigation system, those canals that were hand dug that we know about, that was the start of draining this low-lying area. We need to have a look at that. Is it still in functioning order? Is it still draining like it should? There are many aspects to this. It's complex. It's not simple. There's not one bullet. There's not one answer. But uh, Mr. Cunningham is up to the task. I've checked his credentials, and we will have this journey of exploration. You will get to voice your opinion tonight. I want you to, I want you to be mindful of the fact that we, we have heard many stories we know the degree of, of, of hurt that's going on out there. Your commission is committed. You, you know, the moratorium is the step one. That's, that was the easiest part. Part two, what's the plan? What's the discovery and what's the plan of action? That's where the rubber meets the road. And that's the hard work that needs to go on. And that's what we're committed to. I just wanted to, to, to say that to you. I'm delighted you're here. I expected no less. This is a giving town. This is a concerning, this is a town concerned about the issues. There's no bigger issue uh, in your mind and in my mind and our commission's mind. So know that we are, we are on it and we are, we are on the job for you. Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention and I'm looking forward to learning as we go tonight. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor Cleveland. And, and before we start, I just want to thank uh, a few ladies that have been helping us from city staff. Uh, Tammy uh, uh, Kazarak, Tammy Dickerson, Amy Blackley, and uh, Stephanie uh, Safara. So thank you very much. Um, as the mayor said, uh, I call it the, the road to recovery. So uh, um, this is what we will do. And at the end, when we do the closing, we will be talking about the schedule. And I think that's the most important thing that you need to know as far as the action plan. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to our city engineer, Kyle Fagley, so he could introduce our uh, expert. Kyle? Thank you, Khalid. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kyle Fegley, city engineer, and I'm glad you're here this evening to share with us your input with regard to flooding to Hurricane Ian. It's a very important. Um, you know, this hurricane resulted in flooding, we know, from beachside, mainland, all the way to 95. So it was unprecedented. Um, it's something that I've never seen, staff has never seen, and we've never realized a, a rain event of this magnitude since 1924. So uh, what can we learn out of this? What can we do to abate future flooding for our residents? Well, is uh, 21 inches, is it just too much to overcome? Um, do we have to relook at all our, our stormwater management and floodplain regulatory land development regulations? Do we have to look at the infrastructure? Is it capable of handling the flow and the volume of water? How about maintenance? Uh, is it being maintained properly? Um, does new development play a role? I mean, there's just a litany of questions and variables that uh, we hope to get your feedback um, this evening. Um, and I know there are many questions that you, that you want to ask. So if you just wait and go through the, the uh, presentation, hopefully they'll be addressed. Um, in, in order to you know, properly um, analyze and, and model this, this storm event, um, I, I just like to see manager reference. We really looked for a company that was familiar, an organization that knew about Volusia County. Uh, and, and Jones Edmonds, um, actually, um, many of you probably don't know, they did uh, actually perform the reasonable assurance plan for the city, which is a water quality project. Um, they were instrumental in getting DEP approval through that program. Uh, so we need. Uh, someone uh, of that nature, of that magnitude, that understands stormwater master plans. You know, they understand the exposure analysis. You know, the vulnerability as assessment. So, um, and, and they have uh, experience throughout the state of Florida. In fact, they've, you know, conducted over 75 such, you know, projects and studies in the last 10 years throughout the state of Florida. So, um, with that, I would like to. Um, introduce our um, presenter, Brett Cunningham, with JEA. Um, Brett is um, the Division Manager of Water Resources for Jones Edmonds and Associates. He has over 35 years experience. Uh, he is a Gator. Um, he does have his, uh, his bachelor's and his master's degree in environmental engineering. And uh, he has personally been involved with over 200 similar studies throughout the state of Florida. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Brett Cunningham, JEA. Thank you, Kyle. So, so as Mayor, Mayor Cleveland said, this is the kickoff meeting, so I'm not here tonight to give you answers or, or anything like that, but we're, I'm really here to talk about what we're going to do and why we're going to do it the, the way that we're doing it. And then lastly, I'm here to listen. I'm here to, to get information from you that we think will be helpful in this process. It was off, is that it now? Okay. So, so the, the agenda for tonight, the, the topics I'll be going through, I'll give you a, a project background. Um, I think a number of you, are, or probably all of you are very familiar why we're doing this project. I'll talk also about the project goals. Um, those project goals then led to the project scope that we, that we uh, came up with the city. 
we'll uh, talk about the project schedule, <clears throat> and then finally we'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments. So in terms of the project background, obviously it was the hurricanes that, that precipitated this. Um, Hurricane Ian, as, as we all know, had over 20 inches of rain, coupled with, unfortunately, a very large storm surge. So it was really the worst of, of both worlds. Um, a, little, a little more on that. Um, the, the table to the left is the total rainfall totals from Hurricane Ian that were published by NOAA. And I don't have all of those for Volusia County just for, because the table's too big, but what I have is the top four and the bottom four in that table. And you can see that the top four are all in or around New Smyrna Beach. And then it, and then it really kind of tapers after that. So we, ha we don't have anything more at this point other than the daily totals, we're, or event totals rather. So we'll be getting that in more detail. But if, we, if most of the rainfall fell in a 24 hour period, we can see that we are somewhere around a thousand year event. So that's the, just how rare that was. And if it was a two day, we're probably somewhere around, it was probably somewhere around a 500 year event. So something that obviously doesn't happen frequently. Uh, just, for, just for reference, the, the way the current state stormwater standards are written for peak flow control um, typically only control up to the 25 year event. So, so when a development comes in, they have to control their peak flows pre post uh, up to a 25 year event. And we're talking about probably a 500 to 1,000 year uh, event, just to put all that in perspective. Um, and this slide just shows the, the approximate locations of where those rainfall amounts were recorded. So you can see that the, those four gauges, which were the largest values recorded by NOAA um, in the county, those are either in or right around New Smyrna Beach. So we're pretty confident with those four gauges that you were in the, the 20 inch range, pr pretty much citywide. Um, likewise, based on some of the initial evidence that we've seen, some of the initial data that, that has been collected, we know that in the Turnbull Bay area, in that vicinity, the, the storm surge, the, the, you know, the, the level that the water, the stormwater was um, having to discharge to was probably over six feet. And that's, that's using the standard vertical datum of NAVD. So extremely high rainfall coupled with extremely high tides. Th that value um, is shown on the slide in the blue colors and that's using the DEP slip tool. So at an elevation six, everything that's blue is, is inundated. And then that green is something that's really kind of beyond the analysis of the slip tool, but, but could have also been flooded at that uh, stage. The, the next slide shows the, the current FEMA maps overlaid on the city. So we have, um, more of the inland type flooding, which is noted as A and AE in the, in the, the warmer colors, sort of the yellows and oranges. And then we have, when we get down into more of the reds, the, that's the coastal flooding, the Vs and the VEs. So you can see how much of the city is in a FEMA identified flood zone. And I, I will say that the, um, the FEMA standard is typically for larger areas. So sometimes FEMA doesn't really capture local scale flooding. So this is really FEMA identified flooding. Sometimes we see problems that are, that are outside of flood zones, FEMA flood zones. And then the areas that are shown in blue here are either uh, above the 500 year or between the 100 year and, and the 500 year. So that's, that's the flooding risk as, it, um, as identified by the current FEMA maps. These are uh, just some, some observations that we have, and I'll, I'll reiterate the, the, the need or the request. If you have information on flooding, we, we, this is very useful to us. So the picture on the left, if you can see that, you can see where the rack line is. There, in fact, there are multiple rack lines, but you can see the very top one. So that helps us to determine how high that water got. The more of that that we can get throughout the city, the better job we're gonna be able to to do in setting up our model to say, yes, it's replicating what was actually experienced. So if, if you have any of that, um, 
I'll, I'll have an email, actually, actually there's the email address on the bottom. Um, please send those there. It would also be helpful in the, when you send that if you could give us an address or any kind of description to help us locate that. Some of your photos are probably going to be geocoded, geocoded so we'll know where they were taken, but some of them may not be. So any, anything that you can get, give us beyond just the photos, that would be very helpful. So in addition to the flooding, you know, that this wasn't just a flooding problem. Uh, when you get rains at this event, there's also erosion and deposition problems. So um, you, can, you can see that here in these photos. But there's, there's more that, that comes with it that all takes recovery. Um, and these, these pictures are actually from Nicole. So um, the first one is taken somewhere near the peak and the second one was taken about a day after. Um, and, th and this has more to do with the tidal flooding. And what this is telling us is that, at least on the tidal side, the, 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 it recedes fairly quickly, so within a day or so. And this is a similar set of photos at, at a different location. So we know that on the tidal side, the, re the recovery is quickly and we'll, we'll see what we see on the inland side. So Mayor Cleveland referenced the red dots and, and the map that you see here is uh, similar to the one that's on the, on the easels. So again, if, you, if your red dot is not on here, we would appreciate knowing about it. We'd appreciate knowing how the depth of your flooding, the location of your flooding, anything like that is gonna help us to do our study. Um, there was also reference to this. This isn't the, the first time this has happened. Um, believe it or not, it was, it was worse in 1924. So there were 23 inches of rain um, that actually followed a hurricane. It wasn't associated with a hurricane. It was a nor'easter after a hurricane. So it was already very wet and saturated when this hit. Um, w one of the differences here, though, is that um, being 1924, and, and the drainage system wasn't as well developed, this was actually, this flooding was uh, around for in excess of 30 days. So just a, a couple more items on the project background. Again, uh, there was the reference to the moratorium, um, and that's in place for new development of 10 acres or greater in A and AE FEMA zones until uh, June 27th or potentially later, depending on what, what may come out, what findings come out of this study. But we're trying hard to get this done so we can inform um, that moratorium in advance of that date. The other thing that's a little bit of an aside, but I think important in this is the, the state ha is in the process uh, or has been funding vulnerability assessments for the last year or so, last year or two, and they're doing that through what they call the Resilient Florida Grant Program. And that came out of Senate Bill 1954 in 2021, which was further modified a little bit by, by House Bill 7053 last year. And there will be another, probably another round of that this year. Um, but the city has applied for that. And what we're trying to, the way we have structured this project is if the city gets that grant, which is probably a pretty good chance of that, if the city gets that grant, then, then this project can kind of double dip on that. So some of the things that you would normally have to do in that vulnerability assessment, we will have already done for this project. So it, it really kind of adds to the value of this project. And the, the project goals, and um, this is the one sheet I don't have in front of me, so I'm gonna have to kind of peek around the corner to read this. But um, the, the first goal is to complete the comprehensive exposure analysis. And, and the, actually the exposure analysis, that term exposure analysis actually comes from the Resilient Florida Grant Program, kind of their nomenclature. You do an exposure analysis and a sensitivity analysis. So when you hear me say exposure analysis, think flooding analysis. That's what, that's what that means. Um, oh, thank you, Colin. So the, so the second uh, goal is we want to analyze the impacts of large developments on what you experience. So 
once we put together a model and, have, and have make, make sure that it's matching all the, all the observations that we have for it, we're going, to t we're going to kind of go back in time, if you will. So we're going to take out some developments on the mainland side and on the beach side and see, see how things would have been in Hurricane Ian without those developments. So that will help us to answer some questions. Um, another thing that we will do is we'll, we will be reviewing the city's uh, codes and standards for stormwater, um, comparing those to what other similar communities are doing, uh, you know, comparing to what others are doing around the state and seeing if there's other recommendations that we would have that, um, you know, are you doing enough or are there other things that we'd recommend that would make sense. So that will, that will be a part of the, one of the goals that will be satisfied. And then the last piece will be uh, coming back here or, or coming in front of the commission and presenting our findings and recommendations. So those are the four goals that we will satisfy with this project. We will do that using the following scope. So we are in, in the first task, that's data collection. So we're, what we, because this project is so fast, what we won't be doing is a lot of field survey and, and that, those types of things. So we're really gonna be relying on a lot of existing information. We'll get that from DOT, St. John's River Water Management District, the county, um, DEP, and, and of course the city has a, a lot of very good and useful stormwater information. We'll be able to integrate all that into the analysis that we're doing. Um, we'll review the stormwater code and standards as I had uh, mentioned previously, and those are for residential and commercial development. We'll do the exposure analysis or the flooding analysis. Um, we'll do the new development analysis where again, we'll, we'll take out those developments and see what kind of impact we have. Um, finally, we'll, we'll get a report on this and do a, a presentation at a special commission meeting. And then finally, there will be an action plan uh, at a later date, but done by the city, city staff, and that's gonna, that action plan will depend on the findings that, that come out of this study. In terms of the project schedule, we were really in, already started the data collection, so we're hoping to be done with that by the end of the month. Um, we will be done with the review of the standards and codes by the end of March. The exposure analysis, which will be done in parallel with that re review, we also are aiming for end of March of that. The new development analysis, which can only come after the exposure analysis, we're, we're aiming for end of April, uh, and then end of May for the, the report and the special, um, special commission meeting. And then the action plan, we, we don't have a schedule on that yet because we don't know what that's gonna look like. Um, as Khaled said, the, this presentation is gonna be available uh, on the city's website, which is, which is shown here. As, as will the video of the, of the meeting. So with that, that is all I have for the presentation and I will open it up for questions and comments. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much. Um, let's just have some, some, uh, some kind of basic rules just in respect of everybody's time uh, everybody will have three minutes if you're speaking, and I would suggest that if you have new information for us, please come forward. If you wanted to provide the information on the sheet that we gave you, you're welcome to do so. If you wanted to email us with the information, you're also welcome to do so. But the time limit will be on the screen, so uh, if you have anything new to tell us, besides what we know, since after the hurricane we have went to public meetings, city commission meetings, we received a lot of emails, but we want it to be as productive as possible. So uh, we're gonna start with, somebody was raising their hand over here, I think. Yes, my name is Joe Flutka, 3382 Leonardo Lane. Um, I'd put my red dot on your map, but I don't think it goes out to Venetian Bay. And I'm beginning to feel a little bit like a red-headed stepchild. Even the city engineer said that the flooding is out to 95. Well, Venetian Bay in Promenade Park, where I live, we had quite a bit of flooding. I know we're part of, of the flooding problem, and I think we're still in New Smyrna Beach. I would like not to be forgotten in this, and somehow I'm not getting a warm and fuzzy feeling. 
Well, I will assure you that it will be in the map. Okay. Okay. So if so you have, whether it's your house or somebody else, it please provide. I think we have your your address now. We will. But if you have somebody else that is the there, we'll do that. The whole Promenade Park area looked like Venice, just a complete canal system that really lasted as a multiple day event because we had tremendous drainage problems. So if that can be looked at, that would be wonderful. Thank you and thank you yeah. for your presentation. And also, if you don't mind, we're interested in flooding homes. So if you know of a home that flooded as well, if you let us know, I think that would be helpful. Quite a few, we'll okay. let you know. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Michelle Lindsay, 2132 Burma Road. I live in Corbin Park. Many of you know that area. It's behind Tractor Supply. We've been around <coughs> since the 50s. It's an amazing neighborhood. I'm sure everybody in here knows that. But I just wanted to come up and encourage the um, engineers that are doing this study. I'm not an engineer. Um, you are much smarter than me. I do understand that we have codes and we have guidelines and the federal uh, government, I think, FEMA, somebody tells us like how much water we're supposed to retain on our property when we develop things. Um, I understand that those things are in place, but I can also tell you that living in my house for 21 years, we have seen massive growth on State Route 44. And I do understand that the builders are responsible for keeping their water on their property. But in 20 years, I have a palm tree that still sits in my yard. It made it through Hurricane Ian. It's in a, a center. It's, you know, it was nicely landscaped, but all of the stuff floated down the road during all this. You guys can agree. That palm tree, over the 20 years, the water has encroached on that palm tree. And last year, my husband and I started talking about moving because the water came on the house side of the palm tree. So I can t assure you that even though I'm not an engineer and even though I don't know codes, I have a very concrete object that I've been watching water approach our house. So even though the developers are supposed to be holding water, which I'm not sure how we check to make sure they're doing that when they were illegally burning when they weren't supposed to be, but they did it anyway. So I'm not sure that they're retaining water. So I don't know if that's something that can be looked into. But I'm begging you to come back with improvements. I saw on the screen that it said potential. There is always room for improvement for our city. And this is New Smyrna. I grew up here. It's a gem. It was going to grow. Folks, I'm, not, I'm one of the weird ones. I'm not opposed to growth. But we have to do it responsibly. We have to make sure our infrastructure can support the stormwater. I know this was a thousand year flood, but over 20 years, all the storms, increasingly the water has crept up towards the house. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, I have a few comments. So uh, first of all, I wanna say, um, can thank you to the commission to getting Mr. Cunningham involved. I also think the moratorium on building is right in line. My name is Richard Malazowski. My address is 369 Ralph Avenue. We were flooding. If you know where we're located, you'll know we're in unincorporated Volusia County, but every house around us is, I mean, is New Smyrna Beach, right? So last week I attended the New Smyrna Beach Utilities Open Forum and where they're trying to determine where they're gonna put power lines. Okay, it's a worthy project and definitely one we support, especially on Ralph, because we're, all, we're at the last of the line to ever get our tower turned back on, okay? Um, but there's a twist. It's not the biggest problem we face, and you can tell that by the number of people that showed up here tonight versus last week, right? Um, in 52 years, my house is built, but it's never been flooded until Ian. Yeah. I don't have a thousand words, but I have pictures. That's my house, normally. That's September 29th. This is my backyard normally. 
This is September 29th. This is back, I have a, a, a ditch that was built, right? Um, this is what my yard normally looks like. This is September 29th. I think that says a lot more than a few words. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, so the problem that people in, in our neighborhood isn't power. It's literally getting flooded out. I remember when the water started breaching our house and I realized our home was no longer the safe place we thought it was. It just came in and we couldn't stop it. Okay, so we live in unincorporated Volusia County. We've been asked to annex in, but why have we not accepted that? It's because we're concerned about the infrastructure and we feel like the city isn't focusing on it. We have an infrastructure problem. It's not a flood problem. It's not a, ut a power utility problem. We're all on septic. And what's happening is, is we're approving permits that you can go online and see these permits should never have been approved. Here is a permit, a, a property from across the, just across the street from me, and you can see the septic system that's there crosses over into the other property that they're building. They red ticketed that property, and they're no longer building it. But that was a permit approved by the city of New Smyrna Beach because they were handling the permitting for that area. My suggestion, and I know I'm over, is that we don't look at the, this is a flooding problem or a utility problem or a septic sewer problem. We look at this as a comprehensive infrastructure problem and we leverage these projects and we, it's the same easements that you're gonna do all this stuff on and go ahead and, and bring the resources together and fix the problem in the city. And until we do that, there should be a moratorium on any more building permits in, in New Smyrna Beach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi there. Um, Hello. Uh, my name is Susan Engelman. I own the property at 39 Andrea Drive in, in Fairgreen. Um, we flooded out. We were the only house on our street that completely flooded out. People on our street did have some occasional water coming in. Well, where was it coming in? It was coming in from Hidden Lakes Golf Course. Mine was from our retention storm drain um, pond that also takes in an enormous amount from the Hidden Lakes Golf Course. I have been trying to do some research and I have been coming up in with so many dead ends. It turns out that our area, because our subdivision, Fair Green 4, was built in 1978, uh, along with the golf course who may have had the same builder, uh, nothing was permitted because it was before permit time. Now our HOA owns our retention storm, storm pond. In our bylaws, it only says that the HOA owns and maintains. Maintains has not ever been, um, has never been defined. My big issue right now is that I'm coming up with so many dead ends because all I want is for somebody to come and look at the pond because I have pictures of when my mom first owned the property. So I have been in this neighborhood for 43 plus years. I know the changes that have happened. I know the changes that have happened to our pond, but nobody will take, because it's HOA owned, nobody will take responsibility for our pond to, and to check the integrity. And I just wanted to bring that up as, as a real point of contention because I put $100,000 into my home and I am questioning with the golf course running into our HOA, how is that, how is that okay? And also the integrity of the pond around the shallows of the shoreline I don't think our pond can do what it was intended to do back in 1978. And that's all because with unpermitted properties, the city, the town, the county, nobody wants to touch it. And, and that's just what I would like somebody to try to do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for hearing us out. Uh, yes. My name is Kent Jeffrey. I live at 172 Temple Street uh, in New Smyrna Beach. 
Uh, my house was flooded with 28 inches of water, and I represent a lot of our neighbors when we have three concerns that we would like you to hear about. One is the debris, not only organic, but uh, human that has been dropped into the creek that prevents the flow. Uh, you know, we, many of you here are in the watershed of Turnbull Creek and saw how it backs up, and that's a real concern of us. Of course, we hear about the development upstream, and that, of course, we're concerned about rooftops and asphalt, the bringing in fill to elevate things that all flows into Turnbull Creek. Uh, I'm right on the creek, and one of my things, I was for 35 years a middle school math and science teacher. So I am interested in the science and the math aspect of it. Scientifically, we all know that storms are not going to lessen. They're all going to be greater as we come along, so we have to keep that in mind. But specifically, I was out in my kayak and with uh, my tape measure and measured the openings at Jungle Road Bridge and Route 44. Jungle Road has is 24 by 6 opening. That's 144 square feet. Up at Route 44, it's 16 by 6. That's 96 square feet. So when you had a surge like Nicole, you're allowing 144 square feet times whatever the flow of the water is into our area and it is only has 96 square feet going out. And those people on the other side, the southern side of uh, the Route 44, don't have enough flow, you know, openings to let the water through. This is, we were told by one of the commissioners that unless bridges are failing, we can't replace them. Well, there's two functions of a bridge. One, what goes over it, and one, what goes under it. What is going under it has failed. So this needs to be brought up. I know it's not a city problem, it's probably more of a state problem. But these bridges have failed, not by the vehicles that pass over, by what, but what is being allowed to come underneath it. And that failure has flooded many, many of us in Ellison Acres and many of you who are along the Turnbull Creek watershed. So those are, that is particularly a structural thing I, I really would like you to be aware of. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. How you doing? I'm, talk, I'm um, referring to my father-in-law's property at 242 Oak Lane. He has 10 acres. It's right behind Zaxby's Chicken, the new chicken place. And when they started to develop that Zaxby's, that property there, there was a big group of cypress trees they raised all that land, and this is years ago, it started flooding. It, it's affected all the people on the west side of Oak Lane with flooding. Then they developed Sab Sabrina Lakes there on um, Sugar Mill. I've met, talked to the engineers. I've gone over this right when they started. They raised the property six to eight feet. Now, when they raised that, we incurred a lot more problems. The water used to kind of run off that way. This is a new development. They said, well, we're retaining our water. Yeah, you're retaining your water, but what about the water that did shed off that way? Common sense would tell you water's gonna seek its own level and it's gonna go to low-lying areas, correct? If you raise something this high where water went that way, all these people that have the low-lying land, the new construction, is displacing the water, and it's common sense. These engineers keep saying, oh no, we're holding our own water. No kidding, you're holding your water, but you're screwing everybody that has the low-lying property, and that's everywhere in New Smyrna with its, an older subdivision. Um, the other thing was uh, FEMA took part of our land out of the floodplain about 15 years ago. We were gonna build a different house there. They came out, they removed a large section of that 10 acres out of the floodplain, because there is a section, I'll agree to that, that's floodplain. Now, all that land is flooding. We had water this high on that property. I've never seen it in the 40 years that I've been there. Never seen water that high. Do we get water maybe a foot deep or whatever? When I brought the engineers out, I had to take them, this is years ago, on a tractor to walk out through there. And this isn't related to no hurricane. The hurricane made it worse. This is just new development. 
And you guys showed a picture of the water earlier going across uh, Glencoe Road where it eroded. All that water was cutting through our property, which it could no longer go across Serena Lakes into that ditch where the walkway is, going across our property, across there, and that's where it eroded the big ditch and flooded all down through that walkway there. Um, and I just think that they need to do something more about the water drainage opposed to just worrying about keeping water on your property. When you build up five, six, 10 feet, it's, it's a problem. And it's, not effect, it's affecting the residents that are already there. It's not affecting new construction. That's common sense. So you guys need to reevaluate that. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Steve Gunner, um, 140 Temple Street. Mr. Jeffries, my neighbor, his house has been underwater four times. It's a shame it went under after Nicole even. This is a bad problem. Now the gentleman that was just here, the Zaxby property, I actually videoed as they took that cypress swamp because as a kid we would fish all the swamps. Uh, the cypress swamp on the west side of Glencoe in 44, we used to get red eye bass, catfish, all that. That Zaxby property, they pumped that for about a month, draining that recharge area. Now the shame is they then backfill it, raise it up, put impervious materials, and then they're only required by these statutes and codes to hold a half inch. But water traveling across asphalt travels much faster than it travels through a cypress swamp. So they eject this water to the roadside and then it rushes downhill to all these old mature neighborhoods that were permitted and paid taxes, but now all the stormwater's pushed to these older neighborhoods. Now the county, their, their stormwater drainage policy 9.1.1.5 says we are hooking up with all the cities in the county we're gonna do this stormwater, you know, we're gonna do this. Well, that's since 1993, they've been collecting a non ad valorem fee. Think about that since then. That's gotta be $150 million. And what is that for? That is to plan, construct, operate, and maintain stormwater management systems. That's with the county, that's with you, the city. And I'm thinking, so now we have now hydrologists, these guys are engineers, but you guys have been living it for decades. And now you're coming up and saying, what can we do about this? The gentleman that was just up here was saying it. You've elevated everything. You've developed the watersheds that always fed the tributaries that controlled the release of all these storms. We never had that. I lived here since 64, and this has just gotten completely out of control. The, the, the lady from Corbin Park, talking about seeing that water edge towards her little palm tree, we watched our lawn furniture finally start going underwater. And this is just terrible. There's a, you talk about codes and statutes. HB 503-403.814, the project does not cause adverse water quantity or flooding impacts to receiving waters in adjacent lands. You've obviously failed. I mean, this is not even close. I don't understand how year after year, and we could talk about all those houses that flooded behind Norwoods, we could talk about the floods in the past. Ian was an extreme event, let's face it. It took on a lot of more properties, but that was just a, a reaction to a storm. We've been flooding for a decade, and your codes and statutes, you know, you can review those, but it's not gonna change the flooding that we're receiving now. Ask Mr. Jeffries. You could change every code and statute in the world. I'll bet anybody here, he will go underwater again unless you do something. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for having this meeting. Yeah, I think you. a lot of us really appreciate it and it's helping us feel encouraged. Uh, my name is Suzanne Palmer. I live at Glen Devon Drive, it's uh, across from Pine Island off of Wayne Avenue. I'm 
I live in that big blotch on the map. So my whole neighborhood and all the neighborhoods around me were flooded. I believe that a moratorium on 10 acres is not small enough. There's a parcel of land for sale on Halleck Avenue that is a small, tiny, narrow strip of wetland. If that is sold, there's nowhere for the water that flooded us this time to ever go. How, and it's not 10 acres. It's much smaller than that. My second problem is, like the other lady said, we have a retention pond. It is not flooded since the neighborhood was built in 1982. It's never flooded. But it was flooded by the overflow from the wetlands that had nowhere to go in that area. So please, um, we don't know how to fix our pond. We a tiny HOA of 12 units. We don't have the money and our retention wall, walls floated away. So really, really, you need to reconsider the size of the moratorium. Thank you very much, everyone. Very well. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, Hello. thank you also. Um, my name is Sally Altabello. I live on Pine Island, 832 Island Point. Um, my next door neighbor was one of the first residents of the island and he had always told me in the eight years that I've been here, it has never flooded, never. Um, so one of the things that um, I was looking at was that the canals or the estuaries built behind our homes, when they first were built, according to my next door neighbor, um, they were uh, a bucket wide and I don't know how wide a bucket is, whether it's six feet or eight feet, but it was also told to me that they were, um, the estuaries were eight feet deep. Uh, they are now about four feet deep, so there certainly is no place for the water to go. Uh, my house was flooded completely. I only had four inches of only had four inches of water, which a lot of people will go. That's it. Um, but I'll tell you what. You know how heavy wool rugs are to drag out of your house when they're soaking wet. Um, across the street, that does not back up to water had eight inches of sewer water. I would suggest that the city look into dredging the canal system and put it back to where it was. Um, Hurricane Matthew, uh, the year we bought the house the year before, Hurricane Matthew um, took down a live, a huge old live oak in our backyard, put it right on our roof, um, lifted up the entire area, the whole root system, because they're, because of the tidal um, action going in and out has destroyed the, the ground that holds our plants, holds our trees. And I'm looking at trees on both sides of me right on the water's edge that didn't used to be on the water's edge, and I'm wondering which one is going to come through my, my house next. Um, the other thing I think we need to do is look towards FEMA. The city needs to look towards FEMA and see about getting a seawall, but first dredging to get it down where the water can go. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you just, uh, uh, for a minute, I, I think you brought up the, the, the issue about the canal dredging. Just want to let you know that uh, on January 9th, our mayor, who's sitting right there next to you, we presented before the Volusia legislative delegation who they had a meeting uh, in the land. And one of the canals that we have for a, a, a cleanup and a dredging is the Pine Island and the Gulf Aqua Canal, as well as the Thermal Creek north and south, which would, would affect some of the areas on Temple. But just for, for a purpose of how many people they live in the county, raise your hand. Thank you very much. And Terbo Creek. If you don't mind, if you don't mind, please. If you want to go up there and so this way everybody could hear you. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Khalid, but yes, I, I grew up here. I'm surrounded with city, county all around me, and water knows no boundaries. And you are in partnership with the county, with the state, with the federal mm -hmm. government. So we can't play these games with that's not legally my jurisdiction. I can't do anything there. I, I did not. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we submitted, we submitted for the state. I was saying that we submitted for the state to clean up your canal. I'm, I'm not referring to the county or the city. I'm referring to the canal. So I just want to find out who lives in the county. That's all I want to find out. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Penny Nestori. I'm at 1230 Wayne Avenue, and I'm here with some of my neighbors, and anybody who's driven down on Wayne Avenue probably knew my house because I had a Pelican mailbox. We've been there eight and a half years. After we moved in, the drainage was like this in the driveways, right? So the water always soaked. You can never go to your mailbox without getting this much of water. And we went to the city many a times, me and my husband, with no results whatsoever. As the years progressed, it got worse and it came up higher and higher. And the last five years have been the worst traumatic years of my life. Our house flooded uh, three times in five years. And the problem is, right behind us is Quail Hollow their waterway that goes around them. And you guys all know if Quail Hollow got de devastated. Well, we, two hurricanes, Matthew and Nicole, flooded us from the back. Ian got us from the front. Two and a half feet in the front, three, and a half, three feet in the back. We thought we were gonna die. And our, it's just, it kept coming and coming. The more building and building and building on Pioneer Trail, more of those coastal homes and this and that, the more the flood waters kept coming up, 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 and up. It's, we were flooded three times, but our house was surrounded by water more than that. So the more you build, the more the water is drained to us. We have no drainage system. We have Turnbull behind us. We have Quail Hollow behind us. Where's the water going to go? Our house. My neighbor, Kathy Blackman's house. Peter and Christie's house. We are the epicenter on that street. And anybody who knows who goes down there on that street, you can't go by it. Our mailbox is underwater. Something has to be done. There needs to be other drainage to get the drainage out of our community. Because right now, we have bought another house and moved out. I can't handle another hurricane. I can't handle trying to swim for my life. I can't handle water right now. Something has to be done. How you divert the water, you have to figure it out. Because Wayne Avenue is going to be a ghost town, and more people are going to die. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi there. I'm Craig Clark. I'm the president of the Country Club, so uh, Country Club Chalets off Wayne Avenue. That second um, slide you had was from one of our residents, which I rescued at 1 a.m. in the morning. Um, we have a canal all the way around us. Um, I've talked with the county. I've had the gentleman come over. We looked at the county talked to the city, and now I look behind our, our units, and I see an 80 building, 80 unit building behind us, it's brand new. I understand housing, I understand that, but it's now four feet taller than we are, so I'm really concerned. I understand it was a thousand year storm, but are we gonna wait for a 2,000 year storm? You look at Buffalo, New York, used to snow, get pummeled this year, California, Things are happening, so I'm, I'm grateful for this meeting, and I'm grateful to be proactive instead of reactive. Very good, thank you very much. Um, we had, we had uh, approximately 25 residents um, from 60 to 90 lose everything. So, um, thank you. I'm very familiar with the Country Club Chalet, and I remember in 1994, um, you know, that that's when they had their first flooding. It's a private development, as you know, it was built in the 70s, and unfortunately, the east end of it 
it's at elevation 4.1, and your 100 year flood elevation at that time was six. So you're already about 1.9 feet below the 100 year flood elevation. How is your pump oh, and man. the generator working? So actually, um, before the storm, I made sure the pump was working. I, had, I called our company, I made sure our generator's working, everything worked wonderfully. Um, the power, I, I thank the power company for keeping the power on until the next day. Um, the only thing happened was the canal filled. Once the canal filled, yeah. it was over. So um, I also heard a gentleman come through our community the following, uh, probably the second day or so because you couldn't get through there, from the city saying that they had 47 pumps that failed for the city. I know before a hurricane, I'm making sure that pump yeah. is going. Yeah no matter what. I think what's fair to too is the surge and the 21 inches. And I think because you're so low there, but well. I'm, I understand, but I rescued three people that night at 1 a.m. in the morning because they probably wouldn't been here. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thank you for sharing that information. Thank you. Yes, Gary sir. Wilkins with 529 Prado Street. Uh, in the presentation, I noticed that said we had a one in 500 year or one th in 1,000 year, kind of went back and forth between one and the other. People in the presentations here have been talking about one in 500 year. Also in the presentation, it mentioned in 1924, we had a similar amount of rain in a similar flooding situation. That's 100 years. So in the last 100 years, we've had two 500 or 1,000 year events, however you want to look at it. And I'm not a math genius, but I know that doesn't compute. Also, we all, every scientific study now indicates that the storms are gonna become increasingly severe, gonna become increasingly frequent. I think I'm really concerned that the gentleman that's doing the assessment and the city council <clears throat> is gonna be looking at this as a one in 500 year anomaly. It is not. This is gonna become much more like what we're gonna see in the future. Absolutely. And I'm hoping when you're doing this assessment you did not look at this as an anomaly that's gonna happen again in 500 years. This is gonna happen again in our lifetimes, not mine, but uh, some of the people out here. Thank you. And we agree with you. Hello, Claudia. Good evening, thank you for recognizing me. I'm, it's not the first time I've spoken to you about this. Um, I started talking to you five years ago in regard to the development of coastal woods because our little community is right up against it. And it started with, we talked about pumping, the massive pumping to dewater all of coastal woods into our community, into sugar mill, into the ditches in sugar mill, which have into stormwater structures that were installed over 10 years ago, some were 30 years ago, that are permitted by St. John's Water Management, some are owned by the county, some are owned by our HOA. And as we watched how many thousands of gallons a minute come out of coastal woods for more than a month pumped into our tiny little antiquated system was the precursor of what happened. It, was, it laid the ground and I, you all sat in my, my dining room table and told me what happened in Hurricane Ian would never happen. That system could handle it. It couldn't handle it. Since 2017 or 16 when that pumping took place, we had plenty of warning. A Pioneer Trail's been flooding with ordinary rains. How many homes up and down Pioneer Trail that never saw rain in their front yards, their backyards, or side yards, in their home have been underwater? So it's not the 100-year rain, the 500-year storm, whatever you want to call it. It's the infrastructure that is no longer adequate, was probably not adequate to begin with, has not been reassessed, You gave us easements, the county gave us easements to come in and maintain, the St. Uh, St. John's River Water Management gave, gave us a permit. You're supposed to be coming in to maintain those systems. They've never been touched. You made us pay for an extra easement just recently <laughs> to maintain one of the lift stations in our retention ponds. Mm -hmm. There's been no inspection, there's been no maintenance. Um, my concern with this, I'm glad to see you here. I've been asking for you for five years for an independent study to come in and look at our system 
it's not working, it isn't well designed, it isn't being maintained, it, we don't get a second chance at this. this. This was the big warning. So I'm delighted that you're here. I'm concerned that there won't be interagency coordination with the county. There's a, a road improvement that's gonna happen at the corner of Sugar Mill and Pioneer Trail that's gonna impact that stormwater system. Are you going to be included in that conversation as well? It's not just residential, it's commercial, and it's transportation development that's happening that's going to impact everywhere we live. Because our, our community is developing. We can't stop that, but we have to be responsible about how we go forward and making sure that all of the elements are addressed, not just 10 acres or more, or just residential. Because Zaxby's is an example, that's a commercial development that has impacted the residential development. So all I wanna say now is, I'm so happy to see all these people here. Um, I, but I'm encouraging you, sir, to go outside the box and understand that the data that you're gonna be given is probably outdated. What's coming from St. John's, because well, I've collected it, I've done the due diligence and I've got stacks of data. It's 25 years old. And if that's what the city relied on to create our stormwater system 10 years ago, for coastal woods five years ago, which flooded desperately. Claudia, if I, I know may. I'm out of time. I'm just saying you got to go out of the box on yeah. this. This is a one-shot yeah. deal. You could, uh, Claudia, you could provide the information on the information sheet. I'm saying if you wanted to give it to him, thank you very much. If you could just limit your comments. If you have anything new to say, please come forward. Um, so, Joe, uh, we would like to hear okay. what you have something new to say. Uh, Joe Glubeck, 3587 Casalta Circle, also a resident of Venetian Bay, and here is a member of the Venetian Bay Homeowners Coalition. Uh, Venetian Bay, for those that don't know, is the lar one of the largest and newest developments in the community. Uh, but we're west of 95, and we tend to feel like we're in the Wild West, where not too many people pay attention to us. Um, we do have uh, issues at, in the community. Uh, we don't have enough retention ponds. We have 56, and that's still not enough. Um, we do have a canal system, but it unfortunately is four miles long. Gravity doesn't work, and we had the canals flooding over into our retention ponds. Uh, as we speak, we're talking about putting in a new element called Venetian Bay uh, Village Center East, which is gonna complicate issues that we have in Venetian Bay. Uh, it does not even have a retention pond. Um, lastly, we in that community are losing our conservation areas. Uh, those areas were, were devastated because of flooding. We get an ordinary rainstorm and we're losing that area. And uh, unfortunately, Venetian Bay hates to be the beta test site for how to do things right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Paul Eberly, live in Fairgreen. Um, as some things have been said, uh, I cycled uh, Sugar Mill Drive there uh, a year ago, took some pictures because so I did see a lot of water. I mentioned that to uh, somebody who was living there. They told, uh, that person told me they were pumping out water for a few months, I think four or five months. And I have to agree with the speaker uh, before that if you raise uh, the ground around, then that water has to go somewhere. So all the new developments, which has to be raised with six or eight feet, I don't know. Uh, uh, so it's a structural uh, problem and that goes to the uh, already existing houses. About a uh, hundred year uh, uh, event, uh, I have to say that is uh, uh, based uh, uh, at this moment hurricanes pack more water because, because of global warming. So in the future uh, you will get, if there is a hurricane, you will get more uh, water coming down and uh, uh, be prepared for that. Um, also, um, the city, I think f uh, five years, six years ago, they did put new drainage, uh, new drainage system uh, on Peninsula. 
I've been in uh, one of the houses there and I uh, was told also the neighborhood houses, they still got flooded. So the drainage system, it costs a lot of uh, money, I'm sure. And the same, uh, I think the sand was, was pumped on the beach 10 years ago. I don't know if that's still there. So before you put millions and millions in, uh, in infrastructure, please uh, do a good study. And um, uh, I hope also in, uh, for the long future uh, that you can, because a lot of trees are being cut everywhere, which uh, uh, take the CO2 normally. So please replant some trees uh, where, uh, uh, where they're cut. And it's, uh, when I look around, it's, it's uh, considerately. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening. My name's David Lenz. I live at 110 Golf Club Drive in Fairgreen uh, uh, Development. Uh, my house backs up to Fairgreen Circle uh, retention pond. Uh, I had water in the house, fortunately not too much. But my my big concern is what the previous speakers said about Fairgreen is that all the HOAs are supposed to maintain the drainage. Whereas the golf course also has retention ponds and they are not being maintained. Um, Along with that, my, my big question is, uh, I believe the development is Whispering Pines that's uh, scheduled for off of the golf co club course. Is that the name of the, the development that's going there? Uh, the, okay. They're in the process of, of uh, uh, improving the fire lane. That entire fire lane was flooded, okay? The entire golf course was flooded. Uh, I don't know whether the permits have been granted for Whispering Pines or not, but I would like the city government, engineers and so on, to look seriously at the drainage from that development, if it if has been approved, and in line with that, look at the golf course drainage, okay, because there is a serious problem there. Uh, I know the, the golf course has been there for 40 some odd years, Fairgreen has been there since 78 and 82. It's an old development, I understand that. But my house is 10 feet above the retention pond, okay? That retention pond overflowed. It's the largest one in Fairgreen and that overflowed. So I think that whole system needs to be looked at. Whispering Pines has to be looked at real seriously and there needs to be some improvements as far as the HOAs uh, uh, responsible for the drainage. You know, the, what, what was the builder's responsibility back in 78 and 82, okay? There should have been something set aside, not the HOAs. Thank you very much. Very good, thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. My name is Sue Jones and my neighborhood dodged a bullet. We didn't get the flooding. I'm here to support the people who did. And I want to uh, tell you that I really uh, am, am offended when these are referred to as a 1,000 or 500 year floods. They're happening more frequently all the time. And I find the, that analogy offensive. I also um, understand that uh, this degradation of our environment keeps going on and on. And I don't know if this is true, but I have heard that the Hyatt Hotel that's going to be built behind uh, Dunkin' Donuts will be taking out the mangroves. Now, is that true? Because we know that the mangroves protect our environment and our water supply. So anyway, this degradation of our environment has got to stop. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kimmy Ayers. I live off Wayne Avenue, Indian River Plantation. I have water up to my front door and back door, uh, so my neighborhood did get flooded badly. And I don't know if this is something I'll consider, but a lot of houses will be going on the market. Maybe some of those houses could be torn down and be turned into retention ponds to help create more drainage. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Hey, Chelsea. Good evening, Khalid. Um, I'll start with something positive. 
Um, I really appreciate it. I know I sent you an email. The permitting process with the city has been really easy, and the inspectors who have come out to our home has made this a pretty uh, seamless process, which was a great uh, positive in all of this. Um, I'll do flip side now. Uh, we live at 1327 Wayne Avenue, and we back up to the Turnbull Bay Estuary. And it's been enlightening to hear some of the Pine Island residents because where our house is, we're about 200 feet, I'd say, from Pine Island. And I used to be able to see all the houses in Pine Island when we bought the house seven years ago. I could see the dogs running around and everything. And uh, my husband and I saw about two years ago mangroves just coming out of nowhere. We had just beautiful grass all the way over to Pine Island, and we saw those mangroves growing. I mean, they've got to be 12, 15 feet at this point. And we said, it's not a matter of if, it's when. And so we reacted, and we got flood insurance. And I know when we got our mortgage, we weren't required to have flood insurance. So I know so many in our neighborhood, as well as Pine Island, are in a similar situation. Um, I've been listening to the commission meetings. I'm one of those people that watch and listen while it's happening. And um, I did hear about the dredging for Turnbull, the proposition, and that definitely makes me feel a lot um, lighter going into the next hurricane season, but I might have missed it. Is there a timeline when that dredging may happen? Because that will make the next hurricane season feel a lot better in my house after we put $100,000 into repairing the house. I don't have a, a definite date at this point. We submitted for the state for a grant. Uh, obviously, uh, as soon as he comes back, with his recommendations, then we have to come up with an action plan and then funding will be involved. So there's a lot of options that will be presented to the commission. Mm -hmm. you, you have grants available, then we might have to get a bond, line of credits, using right. stormwater utility fee, but I don't have a definite date, Chelsea, at this point, okay. but that will be coming with an action plan. Great, because that will make the investment worth it, I think, because we're definitely on that borderline of do we sell our house, do we move, um, because I can't lift my house, it's concrete block. A lot of people have asked me that. Um, so we just want to know like what the game plan is for our future, because we'll, we'll be New Smyrna residents for the rest of our lives. So we're here for the long haul. Very good, thank, thank you. you. Yes, ma'am. My name is Cheryl Booth, and I live at 216 North Dust Street. I'm gonna tell you, I don't know anything about codes and statutes. I even had to look up the word contributaries when somebody said that. I can just tell you about my house. I can tell you about the west side of town. We got devastated. I had four feet of water in my yard. And that's because my house is the oldest one on the block, 1926. Everything around me has built, been built up to code. Now this wouldn't have made any difference with this hurricane because everybody in that area got flooded. But I'm telling you, I just don't understand why the drainage was so terrible, why it was so horrible. There are places like Enterprise, Brook Street, Washington Street, Dust Street, Jefferson Street, Mary Avenue, and those project houses are completely empty because they all got flooded, mold, everything. I don't even know what they did with those people. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I wasn't you know, among them, but I still had to move out of my house. It's totally devastated. This doesn't have anything to do with you all, but the insurance, <laughs> you know, like somebody said something before about FEMA. <laughs> um, I'm very, very disappointed. I just wanna understand, really, why it took two weeks for that water to go down in our neighborhood, it was horrible. So I'm hoping something will be done about that. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm a new resident. Uh, we moved down here, my wife and I moved down here in 2018. We finally bought a house about two years ago. We are located on Trophy Hunter Trail, which is right outside Corbin Park. Uh, when we bought the house, we knew that it was a low-lying area. Uh, the, the site itself is a three-acre plot, two out of three acres of wetlands. The house is elevated a bit up on, on dirt, and it's built up. So um, 
during the storm, I realized once the, the water started coming into the home that it was time to get out. So uh, I did take a walk down to where the mailbox is. The private trail was about four feet of water up to here. I put life, life jackets on the kids, three boys, uh, threw the dog in the, in the truck, my wife and my father-in-law, and we took off. Um, it was, it was, I'm surprised we made it through, and I thank God every day that we did, because I, you know, who knows what would have happened if we were swimming in the water, but we made it out in my truck. So uh, going back in time, I'm from Staten Island, New York City, finally made it out, brought down here, we love it in Florida, but back in 92, there was a bad nor'eastern, and uh, it came overnight, and I remember I was a kid, my dad grabbed me, he put me in the car with my neighbor and their daughter, and they drove out, and they got stuck. Uh, also, may let you guys know this was a beach community in Staten Island, New York, Oakwood Beach. Google it, look it up. Bad Nor'easter 92, low-lying area, it's all swamp and wetlands. I, uh, the, the car got stuck. Um, we had to go out through the moon roof. Water came in. Uh, thank God there was a neighbor there to lift us out. So fast forward 20 years later, Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, uh, 2012. Um, leading up to that, we were flooded annually. So I've seen this happen, and the building in New Smyrna seems to be just like what happened in Staten Island, New York, overbuilding, uh, communities going up left and right. This was an old neighborhood that I grew up in, but the new communities were being built left and right without permits. They were building it wetlands, and uh, the borough president uh, and these builders had deals going on, and they, they overbuilt the area. I see the same parallels in New Smyrna. So Superstorm Standy, um, there was about a 15-foot uh, surge, water surge. There was 13 feet of water in my house, 13 feet of water. We just finished building a, a new house and it got up into the second floor. Thank God we left because the day after we went back and seven people in my neighborhood alone died. So that could happen here. I see the parallels. I see what's going on. And uh, it's just only going to get worse with the more communities that they build. Uh, so three of those neighbors were like family to me and they died in their basement trying to protect their property because they were trying to set up a, a sump pump. And, you know, I see the parallels here. It could be worse, and it will get worse. And uh, FEMA, there was actually, FEMA came in, and uh, some of you may know the Ice Queen truck. Uh, that's my mom, Tina Sabella. So she actually spearheaded something with FEMA and created a buyout program. So FEMA came in and bought properties in Oakwood Beach, and they leveled the area. You guys need to look it up. And everybody was bought out for pre-storm value of their home. So those that are interested, maybe we need to talk about it, and something similar can happen here. People that did not elect for that buyout in Oakwood Beach and adjacent neighborhoods, they were uh, given funding through the state and through the federal government to lift their houses. So maybe that's what we need to talk about doing here. And I know New Smyrna Beach has codes, but having houses on stilts, but it's about time maybe they wake up to the reality that the fact it's going to keep flooding. So we need to put that initiative into effect if people don't want their houses bought out and leveled. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good evening, evening gentlemen. Uh, my name is Paul Brown. Um, I live in Islesboro, uh, Sunset Drive. Uh, I've got a couple of houses there, um, 2846, which is on Turnbull Bay, and 2831, which is across the road. Um, a few years ago, uh, put the new uh, storm drain system in there. Um, I did question at the time about moving all the water in pipes from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. Unfortunately, Sunset Drive is at the bottom of the hill, and that was very uh, obvious during Ian and you know the the storm that followed. Um, I got three foot of water in my house, and it was all fresh water. I live on seawater, uh, so it all came from the drain system, the new drain system you put in. And I would I would ask the engineers uh, if they could look at that, please, because it doesn't work and it should all be filled in with concrete or put back to what it was like before. I know there was some flooding issues and that's why you did it initially, but what, what I've seen down there, by the way, I didn't just move here last year, I've been here 33 years. Thank you. Very good, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, uh, my name is Nick Rella. I live at um, Portofino Gardens in Venetian Bay. And, um, I'm not sure if I saw this in the study, but are you going to include a study on whether the canals, the existing system to take the water away, uh, is, that, is that going to be evaluated? And if it is, are you going to share this with um, St. John's and all the other communities? Because that, that was a big issue with us. I think that was our main problem. The capacity is not there. Yeah. 
I think one of the slides that he put up there um, that when he do when he does the data collection, mm -hmm. that he will coordinate with FDOT, the St. John's, the county, and the Department of Environmental Protection. Right, because so this is the third flood we've had here. Only one's due to the, the to the hurricane. The others were just a series of one or two inch storms during the summer, and the water backed up from the uh, retention ponds that are, are on the golf course behind us over there. So, you know, okay. right, thank you. Very good, thank you very much. Yes sir. yes, sir. Hello, my name's John Graham. I live at 1409 Beacon Street on North Beach. And I just wanted to let the, I've heard a lot of other people talk about, you know, different areas. This is one area that I haven't heard spoken about yet. Um, house is 60 plus years, you know, built in the 60s. Um, it flooded. Um, you know, one of the things I do have to, you know, I, I, I want to understand, and hopefully we'll get that from this report, is the development. I mean, I think you've heard it chime in over and over again. You know, in North Beach, every, every house going up is raised up eight feet. It's three stories high, you, want, you know, lot size to the limit. How are those getting through? I mean, you know, again, th those are the things that I hope this report will actually address is, you know, that water has to go somewhere. You know, we're a small little island out there, and the water is going to come. The, my house, I mean, what, 60 or 40 years old? It's going to flood again, you know, if, if this keeps happening. Because I know that the neighbors behind me just filled in a 15-foot drainage ditch. They filled it in and put a pool in it, and they built it higher than my property. You know, and so the, those are the things I want. I, I hope the, the report will address how these city codes are happening, and people are getting away with that. Because that's what I want to understand, is that, you know, like, you know, and what can you do to change it? You know, so, and I do have some solutions where I probably will end up raising my house just because I don't think that you guys will solve it. So, you know, but I do want to know that North Beach is, you know, there, there are other areas too. The, the other areas got devastated far worse than us, but I don't anticipate my problem ever getting better. You know, so thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hello, uh, Rebecca Chaffee, 321 Roslyn Avenue. I just wanted to make sure that the Pioneer Trail interchange is included in the study. Um, FDOT is proposing a new interchange between Port Orange and New Smyrna Beach. It, um, it's going to impact the Spruce Creek watershed. I'm sure that's going to impact flooding in the future. Um, and I've heard 200 million of our taxpayer money is going to be used to destroy that area just for an interchange in between um, that in my opinion is not needed and a lot of other people's opinion as well. So I just wanted to make sure that that was included in the study. Also, um, the county has been dredging a canal next to our home. It's adjacent to our property. And um, the last time it was dredged, right afterwards, the water was raised up very high. All the vegetation on both sides of the canal was totally stripped. It was very beautiful natural vegetation. And I feel that it had a huge impact on um, the water in our yard. We had a huge pond in our backyard from the canal, went over our fence. Luckily, it didn't get in the house, but it was pretty unbelievable. So I don't know what other kind of solutions there can be, but dredging and then getting rid of all the vegetation that soaks up the water is doesn't seem to be a good solution, in my opinion, due to that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi. My name is Glenda Snell, and I live at 2025 Burma Road. We are on the backside of Turnbull Creek. My property butts up to that. I believe the city of New Smyrna bought the property on the other side of the creek that um, uh, faces 44. Uh, I have lived in my house for 30, over 30 years, have never seen flooding of this magnitude, same as my neighbors. Um, we have always had flooding and water standing in our backyard after rainstorms or hurricanes, but it has gotten progressively worse over the years. Like I said, I've been there over 30 years. Um, I called St. John's Water Management District about eight years ago, uh, complaining or trying to put them on notice about the creek um, because there's trees falling over, it's blocked, um, and had tried to ask someone to come out and just evaluate it to have it cleaned out. 
Um, I want to be sure that that part of the creek is on your spectrum for cleaning out or um, you know refurbishing, doing something with it. My neighbors in Walmart, well, the old Walmart facility, which is now Big Lots, um, since it flows around the backside and kind of goes into a mosquito ditch on the south side of Burma Road. So I just want to make sure that it's on your spectrum as well. Very good. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my, name, my name's uh, Brian Ewald. I live at uh, 712 Stonewood Court, which is off of Sugar Mill Drive. And uh, there's a new development going in behind us currently. And they spent months bringing in an endless parade of truckloads of dirt. They brought the elevation up, I don't know, maybe four or five feet to probably the bottom of, uh, of our neighborhood's uh, window sills. And Okay, maybe they did some kind of engineering, but I don't see how it's going to work out long term that the engineering is going to be fine and, and uh, we'll all be fine where we are. And I don't think it's right that developers seem to be allowed to raise elevations to the detriment of existing neighborhoods, unless uh, you can show that for sure there won't be problems going forward. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, thank you all for this. I, I appreciate this. Uh, uh, David Pogany, 480 Judy Street, Corbin Park area. Um, I wasn't really going to say anything because I've spoke before about the water in my backyard. I pumped 40,000 gallons of water, conservative number, out of my backyard before the hurricane came. Six o'clock that evening before the hurricane came, I was still pumping water. Um, it sounds to me, and what I'm seeing is, a lot of these older areas are getting slammed with water from the new growth that's gone around here. Uh, I, th I know our neighborhood's storm system, which was built back in the late 50s, early 60s, is overwhelmed. They, it can't handle the water. Um, I don't know how we're gonna fix this. I mean, where are you gonna, Oliver States, Wildwood, us, where, where are you going to pump this water? Where are you going to, you know, I mean, we got some serious problems. And thank you for addressing this. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to do. Thanks, David. Hi, my name is Pat Weber Sones. I live at 4318 Seamus Drive in Seawoods. And we did not flood. And that's part of why I came here, because we have some very good mitigation designs within our community that helped us with that. And we also have something that I think the city, the county, the state, really needs to think about more, which is the actual environment that you are building in. Uh, sea Woods is called that because our streets are lined with these beautiful arbors of these huge sea oaks that are intertwined at the top and are intertwined through the roots. They are a wind mitigation. They are a water mitigation. When developers are developing these properties, the fact that they're cleaning out all the vegetation is just counterproductive to the kind of problems that we're seeing here. So I urge you to consider a different kind of policy in citing these, these kinds of projects and what they mean not only for the project and the environment themselves but as you can clearly hear for the neighbors around them thank you and thank you for holding this forum yes. it means thank a lot thank you very much thank you thank, thank you, you. yes ma'am hi thank you for having oops. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for having this meeting um lisa martin had one uh right after nicole so and this is like a, a and, and masks, okay, follow up. Um, Linda Woodard from 628 Yupon Avenue, Beachside, Central Beach. And um, Ian was bad, but Nicole was worse for us on Beachside because the river uh, overflowed and had a surge. I mean, I was literally standing in my, in my backyard and I went out at 6.30, I said, oh, is the water's only like halfway to my house. By nine o'clock, it was in my house. <laughs> so it was uh, really bizarre. But like you said, within 12 hours, it was gone. It was like really weird. Um, this is the second, this is, well, Ian flooded a little bit, Nicole, and then um, uh, Irma's the big one that got us because it was at night, it's changed direction, it was a full moon and high tide. 
<laughs> so we really got it then. But what, I, what I'm concerned about is I want to piggyback what the prior lady said, is we have to look at the environment. I'm getting very distraught on Beachside, and like the gentleman said, on Beachway too, is that these huge houses are going up, and they are in the parameters of the buffers and ever, and everything else, but there is no place for the water to go. And I think we need to look at that ordinance and see what we can do. I mean, we're not keeping people from building a house, but building a monster house that's not going to help our environment for Beachside. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Linda Combs. We live on the corner of Turnbull Creek Road and Williams Road. We were flooded. Uh, that new development that's going into Sugar Mill that is west of us, between us and Sugar Mill, there's a, a drainage ditch there that used to be maintained by the Mosquito Control years ago. That has stopped. It's all grown over. I have approached Mosquito Control about cleaning that out. They said now that belongs to uh, the homeowners. They won't touch it, and Mosquito Control has pared down their people, and they don't have the staff to do it. So, like everybody else, if these drainage ditches were maintained and opened up, that would make a big difference. And it's a major problem. I mean, this is the first time we've lived out there since the 60s. It has never flooded out there. It was flooded this time. We had over 17 inches at our home, over 24 inches in the yard, and it needs to be addressed, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Harley Cooper, 643 Middlebury Loop uh, in Timber Trace. And, you know, we, we flooded like everybody else did. But the, the, the real, what seems to be a concern seems to be general maintenance even in between hurricanes. If, if we get this much rain again, we're going to get another flood again. Every, all of us are here until there's something major changed. But even, and I, I heard... Uh, a woman in the back saying that she lives on Wayne Avenue on that stretch there leading into Pine Island and Timber Trace. Seven or eight times every summer, when you just get a good summer rain, that road floods and those homes flood. They, and for people who don't know that area, it's, it's, what, it's all the time. And so it's dredging really seems like an exciting idea to to us and the neighbors behind us we live right on it so we i mean even just during rains it, the backyards always flood and it's always going to be a possibility of it of it coming up like that um so i, I just want to say that I, I i like the idea of that um, i know it's going to come at a cost and things cost what they cost but i don't want to see the money slow down what we have to do on it. So that, that's all I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Chris Sosier. I live on uh, Citrus Open Drive, and I have two questions. Yes, One, what is, a, what is the standard deviation for a thousand year flood? Is it like six, seven? And the other thing is, are you going to post the data in a public domain area so those of us who are engineers can look over the data as well? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more. Yeah. Are you coming? Okay. My name's Greg McCursky. Um, I live at 2580 Sunset Drive, right where Comrade and Sunset is. I mean, every, every storm, it gets higher and higher up the street. You, you guys did a project a couple years back to fix the sewer, to fix the, the canals behind everybody's house. Well, from sunset, I, I'm backed up to Turnbull Bay. Okay, I'm one house over from me is a canal. You showed it over there on, on one of the pictures. Yes. Mm -hmm. Low tide, it's just full of muck. You guys cleared all the canals one mile east of me and people's backyards, then now drains in every canal that goes in the Turnbull Bay. Uh, I, I don't even have to worry about the hurricanes. I mean, I have five feet around my house. My neighbor's house is flooded. I was lucky my house was built in 85. 
It's, you know, so it didn't flood out. But the problem is, even during king tide, we never got flooded out there in the street, never had four feet of water around the house. Queen tide was even worse than, it came, it came up higher than the, the two hurricanes. It's because every, all the water's flowing towards Turnbull Bay and it's making a, a mud hole instead of a, a, a beautiful bay that you can fish out of. It used to be crystal clear water. They built the golf course across, uh, across the way there on the west side of Turnbull Bay and all the fertilizer came in the water and you can't even see, it's all muck now. But I mean, we don't even have to talk about hurricanes and we still get flooded. So there's something that has to be done. You guys did a project and it ruined it. It made it even twice as bad, especially for us down there at, on Sunset. I mean, but thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Our last speaker. My name's Sue Gilkey, and I live at 312 Faulkner Street in New Smyrna Beach. Uh, recently, they built the four-story assisted living, and then the daycare assisted living, and then the church built a thrift store, and then they got to raise their parking lot, and they got to blacktop it, so, and then the Baptist church was bought by the city and they blacktopped their parking lot. And now everything around us seems to be blacktopped and all that water, this is the first year we've been flooded. The water came through, I, we, our lot is 212, 212 feet back. It went past that into the neighbor's yard back there and we've never been flooded before. And uh, it used, when we first moved here, it was like the city didn't even want you to blacktop or cement your driveway. And that doesn't even seem to be a thought anymore. And, and now it's like uh, the eight story on the river walk. Where's all that water going? Because it's all cement and blacktop now. So it's gonna come to my, my house was built in 1887. It's historic and uh, it's, it's damaged and, it, and it's because of development. So you just gotta think about maybe, maybe things shouldn't be allowed to be blacktopped all over so that things can drain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm gonna thank everyone who attended and also who speak and gave us some comments. Uh, as we mentioned uh, in one of the slides uh, about the schedule, and that's, I guess, it's the most important part of the, uh, of the study that after that uh, Brett finishes his analysis and provide the recommendations, that's when the staff will hit the road to come up with an action plan and also provide options to the commission with funding sources that it's available or we could actually seek. So with that, I wanted to thank uh, all of you again and also thank uh, Mayor Cleveland and also Commissioner uh, McGurk and Vice Mayor Hartman and also Commissioner uh, Martin. Uh, and also city staff, uh, Kyle Fagley, uh, Jesse Myers, our assistant city manager, Ron Nybert, and also our staff that been out there, help from everybody coming in. Got uh, Tammy Dickerson, Tammy Kazorak, Amy Blackley, and also uh, Stephanie Ferrara here that she's been keeping our uh, clock going on. So with that, uh, I'm really pleased about the attendance. I'm pleased about the comments we received. We will go back and, and address those questions and we will post them as soon as we get them complete. We will post them on the, on the website and also we'll post this meeting and the PowerPoint as well on the website. So with that, thank you very much and have a good night.